Okay, good evening, everyone. Let's begin with singing 412 tonight, 412. We're going to sing How Can I Fear. Let's go ahead and stand together as we sing 412. <laughs> Trust and obey. Let's go ahead and stand once again. 418, when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. Trust and obey. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on Trust and obey, for there's no other 
lines of five. Then in fellowship's feet, we will sit at his feet. What he says we have a word of prayer together. Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much to be in your house tonight. Oh Lord, what a blessing to be able to leave the world with all the temptation of the devil, with all the allurements of the world, with all the philosophy that is against God, in a world where righteousness is not appreciated nor desired. <clears throat> we thank you we can meet here. We can open your word and we can see the holy God of heaven, his instruction unto us, his love for us, and Lord, that we can be comforted, we can be encouraged by the word and by each other's fellowship. We pray now as we give a portion back unto thee, you might be pleased with the free-hearted giving of thy people. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.
Well, we're in the book of Ruth tonight, Ruth chapter 1, Ruth chapter 1 tonight. As I mentioned this morning, both in Sunday school and in the morning service, I've designated the month of June as Sunday school month, and we're going to emphasize the Sunday school hour. And again, there is no, uh, there's no Bible command that says, thou must have a Sunday school. No Sunday school, you're not going to find in Esau, the Greek or the Hebrew, all right, Strong's Concordance. And uh, there's no, a church doesn't have to have it, they're not in sin if they don't. It doesn't have to be called Sunday school. Some churches call it a Bible study or a group. Some, there, there's no admonition in the scripture on that. Uh, that's a, a fairly recent as far as uh, depending on uh, who you believe stu- if you started, if you studied more of the Sunday school movement over in England, Great Britain, late 1700s, early 1800s. And yet I, I believe in the Sunday school. And Lord willing, next Sunday, if unless the Lord changes things, I'll preach on probably why Sunday school matters in the morning service. And uh, why we want to emphasize that, why it's important, why it's different than the other services. And it's necessary and important. And so I uh, put a little pressure on our Sunday school teachers and their helpers and gave them a roster this morning. And again, that roster is not complete. Hopefully I missed some people that you could pencil in that I didn't think about that occasion. I know, I know Chris Wilson's granddaughter was here today, and I don't have her on there, and she sometimes pops in. She's a prospective one, and all teachers ought to be, boy, they ought to be looking and watching for any young person that ever comes that could be in any of their classes, and say, all right, you think of the world now. Boy, if you think about sports recruiting, I mean, have you ever followed that and see what they do? All right, and that's, for, that's not for anything spiritual. I mean, when they want a player, they want someone, I mean, they visit, they visit their home, they take them out to eat, they woo them, they're in the living room, they go to their games, they do everything they can to get that person and say, we want you to be part of our team, our college, all right? And they go all out for them, all right? Uh, they don't just necessarily send them a letter. Uh, they do some of that, but I mean, they are all out. Hey, here we are, we have spiritual reasons. We're not here just trying to get big numbers and say, look how many I have in my class. We understand that the more a person is under the teaching of the Word of God, and the more that truth impacts them, the more they have a greater opportunity to know Jesus Christ as Savior, opportunity to surrender their lives, to follow the Lord, not make bad decisions, and to learn the truths of the Scripture and systematically teaching throughout the year. It's the only time where you really have the same teacher all year. Children's Church, we got random people all the time. All right, good teachers, but they're all different. All right, and uh, this is the only time all year we have the same teachers all year teaching systematically through the scriptures. All right, what a great time of teaching and training. And so it's something that's important. And so we're emphasizing that here during the month of June. And so teachers are doing the best they can. They should be out there calling, recruiting, visiting. And not just for one big day or one big month. We understand there's more than that. But uh, to get the folks here. And so uh, we've given out these rosters here. I'm still, I need a husband and wife team that faithfully attend Sunday school that are members of IBC who would be willing during the month of June at least. You're not teaching a class at all. You just say, hey, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll take charge of the 15 names Pastor Boyer has here on college and career. And I know that can be a loose schedule, all right? And some of these, five or six of these come regularly, all right? Some of them even teach a class, so you don't have to worry about them, all right? And you just sort of say, all right, I'm going to do what I can to see if I can encourage them to come to Sunday school this month, especially on the 16th, and I'll just make sure I'll be charged. So if you'd like to do that, you let me know. I've got that up here. You can claim that roster for the month of June. Ruth chapter 1 is where we're at tonight, and we're only going to go about 20 22 minutes here. Again, the goal is to wrap up uh, tonight between 645, 650, start our business meeting at 650, and to be able to end at a normal time here tonight, okay? So, Ruth chapter 1, if you've been with us, this is our fourth Sunday night as we've begun our study of the book of Ruth. Four chapters. We're concluding chapter one tonight. We'll get into chapter two uh, in two weeks. All right. Next week, as I mentioned, Shane will be preaching in the evening service after the baptisms, and we'll get back to this. All right. So tonight, I have an unusual title. I'm not one that has unusual titles. Usually, those are evangelists. Some evangelists like to have catchier titles and things. So tonight, I didn't look this up. This is not Googled. All right. So we'll call tonight's sermon title Three Weeping Widows. Three life-changing decisions, all right? Three weeping widows, three life-changing decisions. We'll look at these three. Who are the three weeping widows? Well, that's Naomi, Orpah, and Ruth. And they are all widows. Their husbands have died. They're weeping. They're crying. It seems like there's no hope in sight. Each has to make a decision, and each makes one. You'll have to decide tonight. 
who made the right decisions. All right, let's pick it up. Chapter 1, verses 6 through 18 tonight. Now, we've covered uh, 1 to 5. We've already covered the end. We've jumped around a little bit here in the chapter. We've discussed exactly what happened with the family, Elimelech, Malan, Chile, and Naomi. We looked at last Sunday night, leaving Bethlehem, Judah, Bethlehem, Ephrata, and headed down to Moab. We spent last Sunday night looking all about that decision with Naomi, all right, and uh, how that affected her life. And so we're picking it up now in verse number 6, and we pick up the story. Naomi is a widow. Her husband is dead. Her two daughter-in-laws are widows. Their husbands are dead. Now, I want you to keep in mind their ages. We, we don't know their ages. We're never told their ages. The only number we receive is at the end of verse number 4, that they dwelled there in Moab about 10 years. Just for sake of the story, I'm going to put them conservatively. I'm going to put Naomi conservatively around the age of 40. I'm going to put the two ladies, Ruth and Orpah, relatively young, probably in their 20s. I'm basing that on Jewish tradition. If you study their customs and manners and when traditionally uh, Jewish marriages happen and how old typically Jewish women and Jewish men were when they're married, very car- often between 15 and 20. Ages between 15 and 20, they were married, often between 15 and 18. Now, I don't know any of that. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guesstimate, just based on this, that it's likely, it's likely that Naomi may have been around 30, and Elimelech, similar age, and the boys around 15. When they moved down, perhaps, they could have been younger, they could have been older, when they moved to Moab temporarily, and not intending to stay there. But over time, they did stay there. And over time, at some point, father died. And after that, we're told that the two boys married women of Moab. They married around the same time that would be normal. They may have married anywhere between 18, 20. Who knows? We're never told if they were married long. It's likely they were not married long since there are no children mentioned. All right? Now, it could be that there was a reason. Maybe they couldn't have children. We don't know. We know the name. So keeping all that in mind, it could be that Naomi is around 40. She does mention in verse number 12, I'm too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, I should have a husband and have children, it would be too long. So, you know, I don't know what that means, but it's likely that she could be in that age and that these are relatively younger ladies and that when she's telling them to go back, they could easily marry again and have a future and have a life and have children. So keep all that in mind. You can put them at whatever age you'd like. The Bible doesn't tell us. Verse 6. Then she, Naomi, arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Hey, the famine is no longer there. There's no more famine. Go back home. Verse 7, wherefore, she went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they, all three, went in the way to return unto the land of Judah. So in verse number 7, all three widows are headed to the same place, going back to Bethlehem. For the two daughter-in-laws, maybe for the first time. Verse 8, and Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-laws, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grants you that ye may find rest. (coughs) Happiness, purpose. Each of you in the house of her husband, the idea there appears to be you could marry again. You're young. You could find rest. It's not over for you. You go back. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept, three weeping widows. And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband also tonight, and should also bear sons, Would ye tarry for them till they were grown? Would ye stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. 
Now, Jewish tradition says that they had already perhaps crossed the border of Moab and were already entering the land of Israel by the tribe of Reuben. Some say even they were four miles in. We have no proof of that. Verse 14, And they lifted up their voice and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. Now, that's a goodbye kiss. But Ruth clave unto her, held her even tighter. And she said, she being Naomi, Behold, thy sister-in-law, Orpah, is gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. Now we come to some very well-known words, again, often used at weddings. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. Wow. When she, Naomi, saw that she, Ruth, was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she, Naomi, left speaking unto her. So they too went until they came to Bethlehem. Three women, each a widow, each weeping repeatedly in this scene. And what a powerful scene it is. Each bearing the heartache of death, loss of a loved husband. Each looking maybe at the future as hopeless. I mean, there was nothing more dire in this time and in this society, maybe even in Moab, than to be a widow and a widow with no children. Each of these women had no children in any way. The two younger ladies apparently never had any, and Naomi had already lost hers. So she's dealing with three deaths, has absolutely no support, and there is nobody in any way. I mean, she is really what we would call, at least in their society, rock bottom. And there's no church that's going to help her. And there's not anything really built into the system. And then we have these two young ladies who could perhaps, in a way, rebuild their lives. They were young. We don't know how long they were married. They could go back home, and they could probably find husbands and, in a way, start a family again. So we have three decisions. We're going to look briefly at these three decisions. We'll not go long tonight. Number one, let's look at Naomi's decision. You know what Naomi's decision was? And she made it to return. How many times do we see that? Verse 6, she might return. Verse 7 at the end, they went on the way to return. Verse 19, they went until they came. The last verse of the chapter said, Naomi returned. Return. I mean, hey, Naomi had a decision to make. Now, I want you to know, this wasn't an easy decision. It may seem like it. It's like has been said before. None of us can go back and change the past. Not once. Once the second ticks by or the minute or the hour of the day, it's irreversible. We can never, ever go back and repeat the past. Ooh. That means bad decisions we made, poor choices, things we said. Oh, hmm. well, praise God there's forgiveness. We can never go back, though, ever. However, we can make decisions that impact the future. If the decisions we make are Bible-based and please the Lord, those decisions can impact the future, though we can't go back and change the past, we can change, in a way, the future. And so Naomi has a decision to make. We're never told if it was her decision to go to Moab, if her and her husband agreed. We're never told if it was Elimelech's only. We know it was a wrong decision. If you studied the Old Testament, the books of the law, you'll see that God promised there would not be famine for his people, unless it was due to disobedience. So when we read about there being a famine... For the most part, uh, this was probably due to the fact that there was sin 
in either that tribe or in that area. They were supposed, they should have stayed there. We looked at that. They didn't. They went to Moab. They were only going to go a little bit, but they went a long time. And nothing there good came of it. And Naomi could have easily just stayed where she was. Well, after all, what's back home? I'm a widow. <laughs> I made notes, notes, my sons are dead. I don't have anything. All right? It'd be, I, I'm going to go back home and face shame. There's going to be people that'll look and judge. There's going to be people that I told you so. They're going to feel pity. That's going to be humbling to go back. But she made the decision to return. And by the way, that is the right decision. And you know what? I'm not convinced as you continue to read the book again and again. I know we looked at last Sunday night what she said. And she said stuff like, the Lord's hand is against me. And the Almighty hath dealt harshly with me. And don't call me, Mar call me Mara bitter. But I'm not convinced she really meant all that. You ever said some stuff you don't really believe? You ever said things because of pressure, heartache, pain? And you said it, but you know, you didn't really believe it. You know what? When you read the rest of the book, you're going to see a different lady. I really do believe Naomi loved the Lord. I really believe she knew that God knew what was best. In fact, you see that even in her decision in verse 6. She arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people. And, you know, that was a spiritual decision she made. Hey, she wasn't going back for finances. She didn't have anything waiting on her. She went, wanted to go back because she had heard that God Jehovah had blessed his people. And that the famine was gone. And that means the people had obeyed God. And that that's where God's blessing was. And she says, I want to go back to that. I make, if I'm going to have nothing, I'd rather be where God is than here in Moab. I'm going back. Oh, I know she said things and she was told things she shouldn't have done, telling her daughter-in-laws to go back home, and we spent time on that. But she did make the right decision to return. Maybe some of you, again, you're not in God's will. You've made the wrong decisions. You're bearing the consequences. You're in a bad place right now, and you know it. You've got to make that right decision. You've got to return. You've got to return no matter what it is. You can't wait. You can't put it off. It's not going to get better. God's favor. And you know what Naomi sort of said? If I'm going to fail, if life's going to be tough, I want it to be where God is. I can't stay here because this isn't where God is. This is not God's will. I'm out of God's will. It's not going to get better. I want to go back to where God is, and I'm going to put my trust in him, and whatever happens, happens even if I have nothing. You know what? I, what I like about it is verse 18. I'm sorry, verse 19. So they too went until they came to Bethlehem. Guess what? She didn't just say, I'm returning. She did it. How many times have you and I said, I'm going to do something, we didn't do it? How many decisions have we told God and we just didn't? We, she did it. Let's give her credit. It would not be easy, like the prodigal son. It wouldn't be easy to go back home. You're going to have to admit you made the wrong decision. It, your family suffered from it. Nothing good came out of it. But she did go. She returned to Bethlehem. She made the decision. It wasn't just a wish. Many of us make wishes. We have a desire. Or we have biblical desires. I want to do this. I wish I would. But we never do it. I do want to be a soul winner. We need to soul win then. I do want to be a godly dad. We need to be a godly dad then. I, I want to. I, but we, we, we want to, but we don't do it. And she returned. She made the decision to return. Hey, that showed great humility. Look what happened when she came back. Everybody saw her. Everybody knew what happened, probably. Maybe they didn't. Maybe the story had passed back and forth. It appears that there probably was communication. Where, where's your husband? Where's your boys? And we told you. We knew that would happen. You should never have left. That's humility. There's some repentance there. I believe she was bitter. I don't know that she was really truly bitter at God. I think she was bitter at herself for the wrong decisions, her loss. She had experienced great anguish. After all, if she was really bitter at God, why would you return? Why would you return? You know, if you're bitter and angry at God, you don't return to God. You run from God. You stay where you're at. She went back. And she returned. Naomi made the decision to return. Number two, what about Orpah? We don't know a lot about her. We don't see her much, her name not much. What about, what decision did she make? 
I'm not going to be too hard on her. The Bible doesn't say a whole lot about her. She made the decision, though, to go back, to stay, to stay. You say, what does that mean? Well, remember, originally, all were going to go back. The Bible says in verse 6, all three were going to go back. It says that they all did go back. It says they all wept and they're all gone. Verse 10, we're all going to return. But Naomi kept saying, no, go back. No, you don't need to go with me. No, there's nothing waiting for you. Maybe she could have said, you know what, it's going it, to be a hard life if you come up there. You are Moabite women. And they're not going to be, it's not going to be pleasant. Things will be better in Moab. And she tried her best to talk them out of it. And she did talk her into it. Verse 14 says, now Orpha made the decision to go back home. Now, I'm not going to tell, tell you anything that the Bible, I don't know that she was cold hearted, mean, vicious, rebellious. She made probably the decision most of us would make. That's where my family is. That's where I grew up. That's where my, I'm used to, my customs, my traditions, my gods, my religion. I'm just going to go back home. And she went back. She made the decision to go back or to stay. Going to go back to what I'm comfortable with, my customs, my family. Again, doesn't Naomi say that? Go back to your gods. I don't know all that that means. Does that mean that she had kept worshiping these gods? Does that mean that she had helped her husband worship other gods? I don't know. Maybe Naomi's just speaking common language. Go back to your place and your people and your gods. You don't need to go with me. And Orpah made the decision to go back. I don't think it was easy. She was weeping. But she kissed her and went back. We never told any more about her anymore. That doesn't mean that she ruined her life. I'm sure that was difficult. She said goodbye, and she went back and decided to stay. What does that tell us about her? Evil woman? I don't know about that, but her heart was not set. You have two different women. Both said we're going to go. She did her best to talk them out of it, and though she spoke the right words, her heart was not set, and she did leave. She went back. You know what? I don't know where you're at. I'm not saying you're an Orpa here today, but You've got some decisions to make, and God always demands that we make a decision. Choose you this day whom you will serve. How long halt you between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. If Baal, follow him. I would that thou art not lukewarm. Be hot or cold. How about making a decision? Choose. Go for it. All you've got. God wants 100%. Not hand in the world and hand in here. A little bit of Moab. No, no, no. Make a decision. If you're not where you need to be today, you need to return. Maybe you'll make a decision like Orpah. No, I'm going to stay right where I'm at. It's comfortable. I feel better here. Uh, it would be a lot of change. What about all the unknowns? Might not be easy. Could be, di you know what? That's usually what makes us make the wrong decision. I know, but if I go to my boss and confess some of the things I've been doing, cutting corners, I know that's what the Lord wants. I know that's what the Bible says, but if I do that, all this stuff runs through your mind. I'm just going to stay right where I'm at. Now, it's not the right decision. It's the wrong decision. It doesn't honor God. It's out of the will of God. But it's sure easier to make that decision rather than say, God, I'm going to do the right thing and go with you. As David said when he made the wrong decision to number the people, maybe you know that story. And God said, you're going to choose the penalty. Three choices. Three choices. Remember David's answer? I'm going to let you choose, God. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. I'd rather fall in the hand of God than the hands of men. God, I'm going to leave it up to you. I deserve it, but I'm going to let you choose, God. Wow. Yes, God, it's going to be hard, but I know with you is the right decision. Whatever you decide, God's with me. You know what? It may be a challenging decision. You might have to go to a child. You may have to go to a friend. You may have to, you know you did wrong. God, you know what you need to do. You have a decision to make. Maybe it's easier just to stay there, but that's not what God wants you to do. You need to put your hand in the Lord's and do what he said. May he give you courage. Do what's right. Honor him and he'll honor you. Fall in the hands of God rather than the hands of men. Trust him. Orpah made the wrong decision. She made the decision to stay. We're never told what happens to her. Let's finish tonight with Ruth. We know about Ruth. We read those grand words in verses 16 and 17. Did you see the words that describe her? Verse 14, Orpah kissed her mother-in-law and still was weeping. I don't think it was easy. But she turned 
and she went back to Moab. But the Bible says Ruth claved to her. No, almost, like, almost like Naomi was trying to retch herself away. And Ruth said, no, not me. All right. In verse 18, it says when Naomi saw she was steadfastly minded. I mean, there was no changing her mind. What decision did Ruth make? To follow. To follow. To pursue God. I, Naomi said, I'm going to return. Orpah said, I'm going back. I'm staying. And Ruth said, I'm following. I mean, this is a complete break. I know it could lie ahead. I may not be accepted by anybody. It could be a hard road. I will doubtful never marry again. I may have to be the sole support, and it'd be hard every day to support you as a widow. She's probably told me what to expect. She might have told her on the long journey back. And Ruth said, my heart is set. We read those words. The most important words are in verse 16. Thy people, the Jews, shall be my people. And thy God, the only God, Jehovah God, will be my God. I'm making a complete break with my upbringing, my customs, my traditions, and the gods of Moab. Now, I want to finish with this. What made her say that? I think it was Naomi. Even with Naomi's wrong attitude and trying to talk him out of it and not where she should be, she still had a very strong, impactful influence on her daughter-in-law to the point where Ruth said, I'm with you. The God of Israel is my God. I've seen it in you. I've seen you live it. I've seen you talk it. I've seen it at home. I, I've heard the stories. I've heard you share those things. I know the history. I believe. I'm with you. I'm following. I'm with you till we die. I'm going the whole way. Wow. And when Omi saw that she was steadfastly minded to go, she stopped trying to talk her out of it. Ruth made the decision to forsake everything, to follow Jehovah God. Even despite Naomi's sort of bad attitude, <laughs> poor spirit, she still impacted her family. Notice, she would not have impacted Ruth if she was a compromiser. You'll never impact any family member, as Charles Spurgeon says, has a good quote on this, if you try to compromise your beliefs. Oh, how many people try to reach lost children, lost family members, uh, rebellious people that are saved, but maybe to, by compromising their standards and beliefs to try to lower it to their level. Never will work, all right? Never will. You're not, they're going to influence you for the reverse. You've got to stay your ground. You've got to show them that your relationship with the Lord is the most important thing and that God is first in every way. You never give up on them. That's a tough decision Ruth made, wasn't it? The rest of your life could be hard. Not one, you, you might not be accepted and people may not even talk to you. I mean, it's not going to be pleasant. You're a Moabite woman. We already looked at the, what the Bible said about the Moabites. And what they did and God's judgment on them. Hey, I want to finish with this and our time is up. Let's jump ahead just a little bit ahead of the story and look at two verses in Ruth chapter 2. Okay, so they go back. They greet her. Naomi, it's you. Wonderful. We jump just a little bit ahead of the story, but I want you to notice what happens, what Boaz says about her. Now, how did this get said? How did people know this? This tells you the character of Ruth. Look at chapter 2, 11 and 12, and we'll finish. And Boaz answered and said unto her, it hath, been, it hath fully been showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity and art come unto a people which thou knewest not heretofore. The Lord recompense thy work and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. Wow. I know everything about you and the whole story. It's been fully showed and fully spread. <laughs> wow. What a testimony from a Moabite woman who said, your God's my God. I'm just going to come and serve and work, and whatever happens, happens. Wow.
and people were knowing it and talking about it, and people knew about what was happening, and many of you know the rest of the story. What a grand book, a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ and redemption and some wonderful things. Three weeping widows, three life-changing decisions. How about any decisions you need to make tonight? Maybe God was working on your heart last week when we spoke about Moab and Bethlehem, and you've gone a whole week and you still haven't made the right decision. You're still sitting on it. Did it get any better this week? Did your heart get more tender or more hardened? If you don't make the right decision, it's not going to ever get better. Remember, the longer you hold out on God, the more loss you're going to experience. How much more do you want to lose? Return to God if God's speaking to you about that. Follow the Lord. Pursue him with all your heart. Put your hand in his. Says, Lord, wherever you're at, I'm going to go. I trust you completely, even if this is the scariest decision I ever have to make. Make that right decision. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, what a blessing that Naomi, despite the scars, the anguish, the heartache, the disappointment, the brokenness, despite the great loss, made the decision to return back to Bethlehem, back to God, back to where he was. And Lord, we see a completely different woman the rest of the book, how you restored her joy, gave her the purpose and peace she did not have, turned her ashes into beauty and her mourning into joy. We thank you for the decision of Ruth, Lord, as a young lady forsaking all that she had, how easy it would have been to go back to where she came from, but decided that the Lord God Jehovah was her God. She loved him and wanted to know him. Oh, Lord, I pray you'd help us to make the right decision. God, if you're working in any hearts tonight, I don't know who it is or who it's for, Lord, but apply it lovingly and gently and guide them to make the right decision that pleases you. And may they trust you, God, for you are a gracious, loving, forgiving, and good God. And we love you and we trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right.